Okay, I'm going to begin. Uh, welcome everyone. Um, it's good to see everybody virtually. I hope at this time next semester we'll be able to be in one room again. Uh, so I'm very pleased today to introduce Heather Gray, who will be giving the colloquium. Um, I'm sure many of you know Heather since she's a member of our faculty. Just to tell you a little bit about her career, she received both her bachelor's and master's degrees from the University of Cape Town, South Africa, and then received her PhD from Caltech. Uh, after getting her degree working on the ATLAS experiment, she remained on ATLAS and joined the CERN staff first as a CERN research fellow and then as a staff scientist. In 2017, uh, we were lucky enough to be able to attract her to Berkeley, first as a divisional fellow at LBL, and then as a member of our faculty starting in January 2019. Uh, Heather has won a number of awards, including the IUPA Young Scientist Prize, a Sloan Fellowship, and a DOE Early Career Award. Uh, her research has been in Hadron Collider physics, concentrating on the ATLAS experiment at CERN. And today she's going to tell us about the Higgs boson and in particular, some of the really difficult things uh, that one has to do in order to understand the Higgs. So Heather, I'll turn it over to you now. Thank you so much, Marjorie. And thank you everybody for having me here today. I'm just gonna get my screen sharing started. And sorry to interrupt, but as Heather's getting her screen started, I should just tell people, we're going to have all questions at the end rather than introducing, uh, interrupting in the middle of the talk. And you can either use the raised hand feature or the chat feature. Please don't use the Q&A, but e either chat or raise hand will work. Thanks a lot. Okay, great. So I, I'm assuming you can hear me and see my slides. Um, if so, then I'm gonna get started. And I tried to give my talk today a somewhat intriguing title, which is The Art of the Impossible. And it's going to be about probing challenging Higgs channels at the LHC. And as we go a bit further into the colloquium, I hope I'm going to show you why I gave that particular um, title. Oops. In particle physics, um, the question that we um, are trying to answer is just one, which is we want to know what things are made of. And by things, I really mean everything. And what's unique about the field of particle physics is that we want to answer this on the smallest possible scale. I don't like the word small there. I feel like it doesn't quite capture it. So sometimes we like to say it's fundamental, but that tends to annoy pretty much everybody else because it sounds like we're trying to say this is the most important way to look at nature. That's not what I mean at all. What I really mean is that we would like to know the answer to this question at a level where the components don't have any components themselves, i.e. you can't keep asking this question. Now our answer has really evolved over time um, from things like the atom through the nucleus to protons and neutrons to our current answer today, which is that everything is made up of quarks um, and electrons, at least everyday matter. Of course, it's a little bit more complex than that. So the full story is sort of encapsulated in what we call the standard model. And I'll explain in just a second why I have all these animals um, in a physics talk um, today. Within the standard model, there are two categories. On the left, in the blue and green, we have the matter particles, which are the fermions. And on the right, we have the force carrying particles, which are the bosons. These are the ones in purple. Now focus here for a minute on the left-hand side where we're looking at the matter. These can be further subdivided into the quarks in blue and in the leptons in green. And now one of the sort of particularly um, peculiar properties in the standard model is the fact that we have these generations. These are labeled as one, two, and three. Essentially what we have both for the quarks and for the leptons is we have copies of the structure that we have in the second and third generation with the main difference being the fact that these are much, much heavier. Speaking of heavy, that actually reminds me to tell you why I have all these pictures here. What I've actually done is I took the particles in the standard model and I actually scaled them um, by their relative masses to various different animals as best I could, starting with the heaviest particle in the standard model, the top fork is a blue whale, all the way down to the neutrinos where we're looking at something like a grain of sugar. And the idea here is to really try and give you some feeling for this dramatic scale variation that we have within the standard model, where focusing on the quark sector, we go from birds like ducks and penguins all the way to whales um, and elephants when we get to the third generation. Um, 
On the right, we have these bosons, and in particular, one that's going to be a focus in this talk is the Higgs boson here, which has a mass of 125 GV. I've also indicated in brackets the various acronyms I may use because I'm going to talk about many of these different um, particles. Now, more elegantly, the standard model can be captured by a set of equations, and the neatest way to do this fits essentially on a mug. Um, this is a mug you can actually buy at CERN um, in Geneva back when we used to be able to travel. However, those simple equations hide some complexity. Now, I'm sure the theorists in the room will be getting kind of upset with me when I show you on the right, this is one way to sort of expand out the standard model. Indeed, it's not necessarily the most elegant. But the reason that I want to show it is to make the point that even when we can encapsulate it in a very simple Lagrangian, there is a lot of detail and complexity hiding in. And that's how you get from these equations to the more complex particles we have today. Now, the standard model, it describes all known elementary particles and their interactions. Local gauge invariance really forbids us to have explicit mass terms in the Lagrangian. And this would mean that we shouldn't have particles with any mass. Yet, we know experimentally that both the gauge bosons and the fermions have mass. The solution to this apparent contradiction, equations want no mass, experiment needs a mass, is that we introduce a new field with a very specific potential. You can see it on the right. Sometimes it's called a Mexican hat potential. I kind of don't really like that because who has a Mexican hat where the ends head up to infinity? But the specific potential keeps the full Lagrangian invariant, but it makes the vacuum not invariant. And within the standard model, this Higgs, so-called Higgs mechanism predicts the existence of a new neutral boson, the Higgs boson, and provides those masses that we were talking about to all the elementary particles. So kind of two key parameters in the standard model, the mass, which can be mu or mh, and also something which is called the vacuum expectation value. And with the Higgs mechanism, that Lagrangian becomes um, of the following form, and in particular, the shape of the special Higgs potential is what you can see here on the bottom right. Now, our state-of-the-art tool for investigating um, the standard model is the Large Hadron Collider. And this is located just outside Geneva in Switzerland. This used to be the view that I would see pretty often because I was flying back and forth from here to Geneva. However, that's not actually true because the accelerator itself, which is indicated by this large yellow circle, is actually located 100 meters underground. There are two reasons for that. Um, one, gives us some nice radiation protection. Secondly, it's actually financial. It turns out that different countries have different customs about how deep your property ownership of the land goes. And so by building this underground, Sohn avoided needing to purchase this very expensive real estate in order to build the LHC. The LHC collides um, pairs of protons at, and has done this at various different centers of mass energy. There've been two runs so far. Um, the first one, we had collisions at seven or eight TV. The second one um, at 13 TV. And we're getting kind of excited now because run three is really going to be starting next year. If you want to see more detail, that's the plot at the top right, which is showing you for each of the different years that the LHC is run. How much data did we get? That's what this luminosity is. It's essentially a measure of the amount of data. Um, that actually sums up to our total data set that we have so far. At the LHC, there are a number of different experiments. And for the purposes of the talk today, I'm going to, there are two that are most important. There is my experiment, which is the Atlas experiment located um, just here, right near the CERN site. And our direct competitor, CMS, who are located in the French countryside, really on the opposite um, side of the ring. One thing I don't have time to go into, but just to mention that we're only able to record a small fraction of the collisions that come from the LHC. So we have things called triggers, which allow us to select out that small fraction of events that allow us to do our exciting physics analyses. So zooming in on a detector, what I've done now is take one of the detectors, this is actually CMS here, <coughs> and I've cut a vertical slice through the detector itself, where you can imagine that the beams of protons from the LHC would be colliding at this point right in the center. It would actually be a full circle. This is just a slice here. And it's showing you the various different detectors that we have, which allow us to detect all the different particles that can come out of the collision. Starting from the inside out, we start with a silicon tracking detector, which can detect charged particles. Then we have in green, the electromagnetic calorimeter, which is used to measure the energies of photons and electrons. 
Moving further out, we have the hadronic calorimeter, where you can see these messy showers, typically of protons and neutrons. A magnet, super important, because that will actually cause this bending in the charged particles. And then finally, to the muon chambers, where because muons interact very little with the detector material, pretty much any particle that that's there, we know it actually needs to be a, a muon. These are colossal detectors. The typical scale here is something for CMS, it's about 11 meters. Atlas is something like twice as big. In sort of jargon way, we would tend to say that um, CMS is the heavy detector and Atlas is the big one. Nonetheless, um, the physics capabilities are very simple, uh, very similar. <coughs> there are some higher level objects that we reconstruct. In particular, if we want to find those quarks and gluons in an event, um, we actually use something which is known as a jet. So what happens is, again, we have our protons colliding. They produce either a quark or a gluon. And these actually go through a process called hadronization and form a bunch of particles. But they're kind of collimated in this direction. Once they reach the calorimeter, they deposit all their energy. And we can actually figure out the energy of the original quark or gluon by really summing up all these energy deposits in the calorimeters. Caveat is a little bit simple. These days in modern LHC, we also use the tracking information in addition. But nonetheless, the concept is really the same. <coughs> Secondly, it turns out that some of the quarks, and these are going to be very relevant for what I talk about today, we have an extra handle on noticing that they're there. And this is for the so-called heavy quarks, in particular the bottom and the charm quark. They have an appreciable lifetime. So they fly some distance in the detector before decaying to other particles. Sometimes they can be a secondary vertex, sometimes they can be a tertiary vertex. And we can really detect their presence by identifying these vertices within one of these jets, which is what you would get for all the different um, quarks to do it. So now I'd like to move on to talk a bit about um, the Higgs boson and its discovery. At the Large Hadron Collider, there are essentially four key ways in which we produce a Higgs boson. And they're ordered here on this slide using these Feynman diagrams from the most common at the top left to the least common at the bottom right. The most um, main production channel is what is called gluon-gluon fusion, where you can see these two gluons here, they fuse via a top loop and produce a Higgs boson. This has pretty large cross section, which has translated into something like 7 million Higgs bosons produced through gluon-gluon fusion um, at the ATLAS experiment. On the right, we have vector boson fusion. Here, it's a quark initiated process, produce vector bosons, which fuse to produce the Higgs. But what's characteristic here is we have these two quarks which head off into the forward regions of the detector, leaving the Higgs isolated in the center. So a very striking signature. <coughs> the bottom two are the most relevant for what I'm going to talk about today. Bottom left is associated production, or Higgs straling, as we like to call it, where a quark-antiquark pair produce a B. This is shorthand for either a W or a Z boson, which radiates off a Higgs. You'll notice here that the cross section is dropping quite rapidly. We're only at about 300,000 Higgs bosons um, by the time we get here. The rarest one that we look for that will be relevant today is called associate production with two top quarks. If you look at the final state, it's kind of similar to VBF, but what's going on inside is a little bit different. What is produced is um, a Higgs boson and two top quarks. And then these top quarks will actually subsequently decay in the detector. Of course, we also need to think about how does the Higgs boson decay? And I kind of like to show this plot even though we don't care about it anymore, because what it's showing is the probability of the Higgs to decay to various different particles as a function of the mass of the Higgs. Now, of course, we've seen the Higgs. We know it's mass, 125. So actually, only one point is true. Um, however, the reason I like to show it is that we were kind of lucky at the LHC. It just so happened that the mass of the Higgs in nature was at that value where experimentally the maximum number of channels could be probed. And that meant we have all sorts of things to measure. The theorists may say something different, in particular, the Sudhis theorists. They probably would have preferred having a slightly lower mass. I think a nightmare might be a bit of an exaggeration here. But nonetheless, for well, Susie, it would have been convenient had it been a bit lighter. At the LHC, there are really five main decay channels. And these are the Higgs to BB channel, the Higgs to WW channel, which you can see here in green, Higgs to Tau Tau, which you can see in red, and then two rarer ones, um, Higgs to ZZ, which is hiding here in the sort of wavy blue curve, 
and Higgs to a di photon, which is way down here in pink. And what you'll see in a bit later is even though these two channels are pretty rare, they're actually going to play a big role in the discovery of the Higgs boson because they actually have very small backgrounds. So indeed, it was on the 4th of July, um, 2012, which is a day I like to call um, Higgs Independence Day. Of course, that's not quite right. We should maybe call it Higgs Dependence Day. And what happened is there was a seminar given at CERN by Joe Candela. He's a professor at UC Santa Barbara, and he was the spokesperson of CMS. And Fabiola Giannotti, who was the spokesperson of um, ATLAS, where they showed the results that both collaborations had found about the Higgs boson. I was not actually there um, at the time. I was actually in Lindau, small town in Bavaria, at the so-called Nobel laureate meeting. And unfortunately, we had talks by other Nobel laureates at the same time. So I ended up on a bootleg setup with a number of other postdocs and students kind of skipping some of those talks to see it. We were joined by people as um, time went on, including David Gross um, at one point. This one slide is trying to show you um, what was contained in the discovery. The data set that was used was two times five inverse photons of slightly different energies. And we ended up with an observation with a significance level of um, five sigma. And the plot on the bottom right actually shows you how to interpret this five sigma in terms of the probability. It's really tiny, something like 1.3.5 million chance of a statistical um, fluctuation. That's sort of what we tend to use in particle physics for calling something an observation. Some might call us conservative. Now at that seminar, CMS actually showed results in all of those five Higgs decay modes that I mentioned. Whereas Atlas, we made a different decision. We showed only gamma gamma and ZC. However, we actually had slightly greater sensitivity um, than CMS. And in this discovery, in this measurement, there were really key roles by a number of UC Berkeley members um, in this discovery. There were two papers published afterwards in Physics Letters B, and um, the Nobel Prize was awarded to Peter Higgs and Francois Englert in 2013. At the bottom here, I have a few plots. One is showing you on the left. This is the invariant mass in the diphoton channel and light for all particles. You want to look for a little bump here, which indicates the presence of some particle decaying to a pair of photons. In the middle, I have the plot from the Higgs to ZZ, subsequently decaying to four leptons. And here you want to have a look at this little blue histogram, which is showing you the position for the Higgs with a mass of 125. And as I mentioned, <coughs> that's the probability. Now, it was a really long road um, to the discovery of the Higgs boson. In 1992, there was the letter of intent written about the Atlas experiment, followed by the technical proposal in 94, the formal approval in 97. And in 99, there was a technical design wrote, report written. And this is something where you try to characterize what an experiment would be able to do. And I mentioned that because it's going to come back later in this talk. We inaugurated the cavern, took our first collisions in 2010, and reached the Higgs boson discovery in 2012, <coughs> many years after the first ideas for the Atlas experiment. Now, after discovery, we need to change and to move on to measuring the properties of the Higgs. Of course, um, you can go and have a look at those properties in the PDG. I have the snapshot from the first time that the Higgs appeared in the PDG. It's a lot more extensive these days. And key properties of the Higgs, and indeed any particle, are things like the mass, the width, the spin, the charge, the parity. In fact, in the standard model, that's particularly interesting to check because the Higgs boson is the only known scalar. So if we found out that it was not a scalar particle, we'd know it wasn't the Higgs, it would be something else. We also need to measure the couplings of the Higgs to fermions and gauge boson. And we can check this by measuring those production and decay modes that I showed. Finally, there's this one weird feature of the Higgs, which is the self-interaction, the fact that the Higgs boson can interact with itself and more so by not even changing itself. I could give you an entire talk about what we know about the Higgs boson, not going to do that today. Just wanted to show you two results. On the left, this is a measurement of the mass of the Higgs boson. And there are a whole bunch of different measurements, but if you like, you can just have a look at the bottom where you can see, for example, the combination of Atlas and CMS and RAN1 or the combination from Atlas between run one and run two. And the point is, is that we know it's 125 GV, but more interestingly, we've already measured this to something like 0.2% um, precision. 
Particles also have a width, which relates to the lifetime. And here is a recent result from CMS showing the measurement of the width of the Higgs boson. And this is actually pretty cool. It's a really clever method that rely, which unfortunately relies on some strong theory assumptions. Nonetheless, it allows us to make a measurement three orders of magnitude below what we expected we might be able to do. So far, all these properties we've checked have really been consistent um, with the standard model predictions. Some people might say that this was an expected discovery, and this is due to something which is called the no-lose theorem. My perspective is I don't think the discoveries by definition are never really expected. However, for the LHC, we were really lucky because we had strong arguments that we needed to see something. If we looked experimentally, there were limits that the Higgs mass should lie between 114 and 200 GB. This is based on previous accelerators. And also from constraints, where you do a fit to all other measurements um, in a set of electroweak data. And that's actually the plot here. The things in yellow, they were excluded, and that's how you get the range. Theoretically, we knew that we needed some mechanism that would be able to give us that mass to the W and Z bosons, because we knew that they had masses. We had in the theory that they couldn't. On top of that, you end up with non-physical predictions. More technically, something called unitarity gets violated if we actually found um, nothing below one TV. And so that meant that if you could go and build a collider, search for this, either you need to define the Higgs boson or you had to know that there was something deeply wrong with your theory. The diploton and the ZZ analyses, they played a key role in driving the design requirements for ATLAS and CMS. For example, we needed to have good diphoton and di muon mass resolution perhaps better than 1% at 100 GB. Also needed to have wide geometric coverage, i.e. to determine the size of the um, detectors. And here's a quote from the CMS physics TDR, remember the technical design report, <coughs> saying that the Higgs to gamma gamma analysis is one of the most promising channels, really was an important motivation for the design of the electromagnetic calorimeter. I think that the discovery of the Higgs boson is the greatest achievement of the LHC to date, Atlas and CMS were designed to and did indeed discover the Higgs boson. But today, for the rest of my talk, I want to talk about something a little different, what was not predicted and not expected, and indeed some things that were even thought to be impossible at the LHC. And my goal here is to provide you some ideas about what happened to make the impossible possible, with the hope that this could stimulate creativity for future measurements. And the topic that I will focus on is the interaction of the Higgs boson with the quarks. At the moment, we have no explanation for why the fermion masses span many orders of magnitude. That's what you can see in the plot here, the fermion mass and the Higgs coupling. Also highlighted a few with some of the animals just to give you a feeling for some of the sense of scale. Equivalently, there is a large variation in the coupling strength of the Higgs to fermions. This is um, added by hand as terms in the Lagrangian, and it is something known as the standard model flavor puzzle, as in why all these particles have such different masses. One way to address this is ready to probe it. And I'd like to start by talking about um, probing the coupling of the Higgs to bottom quarks. As I mentioned, the Higgs decays most often to a pair of bottom quarks, something like almost 60% of the time. It's the largest branching ratio. This means it makes the largest contribution to the total width. It also can tell us things about the Higgs coupling to fermions and more particularly, the Higgs coupling to the quarks, the third generation in particular. Now, if you want to go and measure the decoupling of the Higgs to V quarks, if you want to use a single Higgs boson and look for a decay to V quarks, this is extremely challenging. And the reason for that is this plot on the right, which shows you various different cross sections at different energies. And for the LHC, we can just have a look at this dotted green line on the right. This red one shows you the cross section for a pair of die jets, i.e. two bottom jets. And if you go zoom all the way down here to one of these brown curves near the bottom, this is actually the cross section um, for um, Higgs production. Sorry, my arrows shifted. I want you to look at this, but this brown one third from the bottom. So it's many orders of magnitude, something like 10 to the eight larger. There's also no clear trigger. And so it turns out that it's better to use associated production, even though it has a cross section um, a lot smaller because it has smaller backgrounds and a clear um, trigger. By the way, I used to say it was impossible to go measure a single Higgs to B quark. Um, however, 
and some folks at CMS proved that they could actually at least do a search for it. I'm not so sure this one will stay impossible. Now in the Atlas TDR, um, this, there was a study looking at the WH Higgs to BB channel. And in total, there are actually three different channels that you can think about. Depends which vector boson you have and also how that vector boson decays. Does it decay to neutrinos? Then it's zero lepton. Does it decay to one lepton? It's one lepton and so on. And in particular, this is actually the selection. I just show this for any experts who are curious to see how it looked back in those days. But I would, what I'd like you to focus on here is this was the expected mass of those two B quarks. And remember, like we saw in the diphoton plot, we're looking for a little peak here, which would be a particle. In fact, it's pretty hard to see. What you actually need to look at is you need to look at the dashed line. That's the shape of the background. The solid line is where you would see the signal. So looking at that plot, you don't need anyone to tell you that it would be very difficult. In fact, what they said is it might be extracted if all the backgrounds were known. Even in this optimistic scenario, it's below three sigma for values of MH above the sensitivity of the previous accelerator. And it is not clear in all cases how to achieve an accurate knowledge of the various backgrounds from data. In conclusion, they said it would be very difficult at the LHC, even at the most optimistic assumption. So not impossible, but indeed, really difficult. In fact, it turned out that the prospects for VHBB were thought to be so dire that they thought that a different channel moving on to that associated production with a pair of top quarks or TTH might be even more promising. And so here is again a paragraph from the TDR and also a plot here where you can see what the invariant mass distribution would look like. And here you want to look at the background of the dotted curve and actually the data. You can notice there's a much larger excess. <laughs> in fact, what they thought is that it would be feasible and you could reach something like five sigma in a mass range for Higgs bosons. We didn't know the mass at that point with an a luminosity of 300 inverse femtobonds. By the way, we haven't yet got 300 inverse femtobonds. We might actually get that by the end of the next run of the LHC. And so that would have meant that this would take a very long time to do. However, something changed. There was a paper by John Butterworth and some others in 2008 and what they said in that paper is they found a large improvement in the significance for the Higgs to BB channel if they didn't try to look at all events, but instead they selected events where the Higgs has high transverse momentum or high energy, we usually call this PT, and using something called jet substructure techniques. I don't have time, we could have again a whole seminar about jet substructure, but essentially the idea here is to think about those jets of particles and to think that they could actually be ways to look inside those jets and learn a lot more about what type of jets they have. If you apply such techniques, they made this plot here. And here you want to look at the blue, which would be the signal for the Higgs. And they conclude in their paper that while this Higgs to BB was regarded as a poor search channel due to large background, with these techniques, it can be recovered as a promising search channel um, for the standard model Higgs boson. However, it turns out that they were right and also not fully right. It, the key observation is the fact that the PT spectrum of the signal is much harder than the background. What I mean by that is if you have a look at this plot here, on the x-axis is that transverse momentum. So essentially think about it as the energy. And you want to compare the signal, which is this black dotted dash line, to the background, which is this black dotted line. And you'll notice that as you go up to higher and higher values, you end up having um, more of the signal and the background falls off more quickly. And so you can imagine just putting two cuts, if you shift the cut here, you're really going to decrease how much background you have compared to the signal. And the fact that they were interested in using these substructure techniques, those only work in the sort of high momentum range meant they applied that cut. And this was actually the key gain in really improving the analysis. And so what's done in current Atlas and CMS analyses is using explicit categories in transverse momentum and also as input variables to machine learning algorithms. Another clever idea, which I have no time to discuss, was a trick that we came up with to define a 100% efficient trigger. That's the way we could select events for those with missing energy. And this allowed us to really recover the <coughs> Z to nu nu BB channel at the LHC. Here's an example of what such an event might look like in the Atlas detector. You can see two jets. And in fact, this is the one with missing energy. This is this red dotted one. And by analyzing all the data and putting it all together, 
we come to a combination of the searches for the Higgs decay to B quarks. Um, on the left here, this is a plot from Atlas, which shows you the invariant mass of those two B jets. And here you want to look at the signal, which is in red. The gray is a background that comes from diboson production, and all the other backgrounds have actually been subtracted off so that you can see the peak. On the right, this is a plot from CMS. They had equivalent analyses where they show the measurement of something which is called mu. So this is essentially kind of like a cross section. Um, but what you want to pay attention to is that if the value of mu comes out to be one or consistent with one, that means that we're looking at something like the standard model. Indeed, if you want to go beyond the standard model, you should look for something that's not equal to one. Now, the significance was reported by the two experiments, and this was in August 2008, um, was around five sigma and consistent with the expected. And when we get to about five sigma, that's when we can claim observation of the Higgs decay to B quarks. Also happened to be observation of um, associated productions that hadn't been seen before yet. That was a few years ago. There have been many measurements since. I just wanted to pull out two here. Um, those boosted jet techniques, yep, we're still looking at them, but we've refocused them on looking at Higgs production in extreme regions. For example, moving into the high momentum region. And that's interesting to look at because that might be a good spot to look for um, new physics. And so here's one of those invariant mass distributions, but the key is that you're really looking at that high region. We've also looked at other production modes, for example, vector boson fusion. Here is a recent plot, um, paper came out just, um, just this year. <coughs> and there, there's actually a nice trick that you can play. If you look for vector boson fusion with an additional photon, which you can see here, it turns out that you can dramatically improve your signal of a background because the signal tends to have quarks, which can actually radiate, radiate off these photons. And so that one was published in another paper, um, which you can see here. And so what we're doing is we're really moving beyond the observation of the channel, really into using it as a tool to learn exciting things about nature. Moving on to the heaviest quark, the top quark um, couples very strongly to the Higgs boson. For example, if you had a top mass of 173 GV, you end up with a coupling round about one. The top quark is the main culprit in the instability of the Higgs mass, and it could easily and it could play a key role in electroweak symmetry breaking or as a window to new physics. The Higgs boson cannot decay to top quarks, so we need to probe this with production modes sensitive to the Higgs um, top coupling. The reason it can't, of course, is because of the mass. That top quark, that blue whale, is heavier than our Higgs boson. We can extract indirect constraints on the top Higgs Yukawa coupling using um, existing channels. For example, gluon gluon fusion, as I showed you, proceeds through this loop of top quarks to produce the Higgs. Similarly, if you look at the Higgs to diphoton decay, it also goes through a loop. And so by measuring the rates of such processes, you can really um, have indirect evidence for the coupling to top quarks. Of course, there's an assumption there, and it's an important one, is that there would be no other new particles hiding there. Now, TTH production, on the other hand, where you can see the diagram here, you can see the coupling of the top to the Higgs. Here, you really observe those top quarks directly. And that means that you really know that you're looking um, at that coupling that you want to. And it allows us to prove any new physics contributions we might have in those vertices. However, the cross section for TTH is really small at the LHC. We need all decay channels to um, boost sensitivity. And the three key ones are TTH with the Higgs decaying to bottom quarks, TTH with Higgs to multi leptons, and also TTH with Higgs to diphoton. I won't talk about the third one at all today, um, but you have some experts in the room, so you can certainly ask Professor Wang or Shapiro if you'd like to know more. Now, what did we think about this in the TDR? At the top, this is a comment about TTH Higgs to BB, says that it would be highlights the challenge that is faced in, in observing TH, TTH. And in particular, the challenge is this background uncertainty. And this is saying what they expected to see this, as the significance, depending on how accurately you can measure um, the background. For TTH Higgs to multi leptons, the comment was the signal is small and clear distinguishing features such as resonance peaks have not been established. The backgrounds are larger and the uncertainties have not been fully controlled. The analysis is very challenging, dot, as in they didn't really even make a projection about how well we might be able to do. So now let's um, turn our attention to TTH with Higgs to BB. 
These are the Feynman diagram at the bottom here. So you see your two top quarks, you see your Higgs boson, and now you have to think about the decays. And these ones are very busy events. A typical event includes four, bottom, four B jets from bottom quarks, two light jets, a lepton, and missing energy. And so the way that you actually do this analysis is you need to really split the events into categories <coughs> according to the number of jets and B jets. This allows us to take events, events where you have um, a high signal of a background and events which have a low and separate them out. And this actually improves your um, total sensitivity. And this is the plot on the bottom here. I don't want to go into the details. I just want to show you some of the different ways in which we actually define these signal and control regions. It's to do with how like a B jet they look um, to do it. And you can divide the categories. Actually, they're formal plots, just like this one. There's an extra thing you do, and I'll come back to that a little bit later, is you can constrain systematic uncertainties from these signal depleted categories. And this turns out to be very important. And finally, you will fit some multivariate discriminant to separate your signal from the background. Now, a statistical method that is exploited throughout Higgs analyses is the profile likelihood fit. And the key idea here is to use the data itself to be able to constrain the backgrounds and reduce those systematic uncertainties. That might sound a bit crazy. So let's take a look at an example. Here is a plot from Atlas in one of our TTH categories, and it's some booster decision tree output. But what I want you to pay attention to is we have the data. These are the black points. We have our Monte Carlo pr our predictions from our simulation um, and the various colors of the background, the signal, the exciting one, this is what you see in red. But even more so, you see the uncertainty we have on our prediction. You can see it's large, something like almost 25%. However, you can look, for example, at this first bin here, and you notice that there's basically no signal. There's a huge amount of data, and the uncertainty bars on the data are way smaller than the prediction. And so what you can imagine doing is you can actually think that you can constrain our predict our uncertainty based on that data. Of course, the true thing is a little more complicated. We take all the different bins, we account for signal and background, but nonetheless, that's the concept. And once you do it, you end up with these tiny uncertainty bands here, which actually allows us to see the signal. I do want to say this sounds like magic. Um, it is indeed very powerful. It also can be dangerous. Because if you have an inadequate fit model, this can actually lead to significant bias in your result um, to do it. And you may not necessarily get a good warning for when that can occur. <laughs> Here you can see um, the results um, that we had um, from TTH at the time of when the, um, from Higgs to BP. And on the left is the Atlas result in different categories. Doesn't matter. I want you to pay attention to the final result here. It's again that new one, which is a measure essentially of the cross section compared to the standard model. And on the right, you can see some relief for um, CMS. And so um, here, the expected and um, significance was just under evidence, so something like three or 2.2. The observed significance was lower. So this is what we call a downward fluctuation, something like one sigma. Next, I want to talk about something called TTH to multi-lepton. And I'm going to need to explain to you what that looks like. Here is a sample Feynman diagram. And you'll notice immediately that the characteristic here is to have lots and lots of leptons. Now, despite being studied in the Atlas TDR, there were actually initially no LHC analyses looking for TTH using multi-lepton channels. You can see why people said that this doesn't look very promising. However, around about 2013 or so, um, it was realized that these channels would already be quite sensitive with the existing LHC data set. And so these multi-lepton analyses began, but later than many of these other Higgs analyses. And here are two, they're going to be categories, just like before. And here are two examples of the two most important ones. There are the same sign two leptons here. You can see them circled. And you can see the three lepton channel, again, circling out the leptons. And otherwise, you have some neutrinos, you have some jets, always some B jets as well. <laughs> now, the problem with the multi lepton analysis is that you cannot easily separate all those different decay roads of the Higgs that might give you leptons. So, what we do is we actually just lump everything together and we make channels according to how many light leptons, we mean just electron or muon, and how many tau's. And this is a plot here. Each of the colors, these are various different analyses categories. These are very different to the BB, where there was lots of background. Here, the signal is very low. 
but the background's low. However, there's one particularly nasty background, which is the TTW um, background. The analysis strategy uses a combination of cut and count categories with multivariate discriminants. And this allows us to overcome the limitations of the lack of clear peaks and also many of the backgrounds. One thing we did, which was kind of fun and very powerful, was to use a five-dimensional multinomial boosted decision tree in the three lepton channel. There's a sketch on the right kind of trying to give you the idea. Conventionally in a BDT, you would have some signal and you separate it from the background. But in this channel, there are actually a whole bunch of backgrounds. And so what you can do is you can basically have a target for the signal and for each of the different backgrounds. So it allows us to really quite optimally extract the signal and define control regions at the same time. As I mentioned, a large and challenging background for TTHML is the TTW background. Here's a plot showing you it in one of the channels. And the problem is that it's very, very similar to the final state to the signal itself, which is the TTH, um, thanks to WW. On top of that, because it's so similar, it's really very hard to define a clear control region. And it's actually difficult to predict and to simulate accurately. Historically, if you look at other measurements of TTW production, for example, here's a plot on the right showing you a bunch of measurements from Atlas and CMS. There are again cross sections, but you can maybe pay attention to the muse. You'll notice that in many cases, there are significant deviations from the predictions up to like 60%, which is pretty large actually. There are also corrections that need to be made for next to leading order, um, higher order corrections for QCD and electroweak, and these can be in the order of 10%. And so even to be able to consider this channel really required er accurate theoretical predictions, thanks to things like the NML revolution. Finally, there's significant correlation between TTW and TTH. So these were the um, TTH multi-lepton results, both from Atlas and CMS, a whole bunch of channels, don't need to pay attention to it. You just wanna have a look at the final combined value, notice a bit high um, from Atlas. Similarly, you could look at CMS, well, a little bit high, not as much, and here you can see a table of the significances where for both of them had the same expected significance, but Atlas had a higher fluctuation, so 4.7 sigma versus CMS is 3.2. So putting those channels together, together with that diphoton channel that I didn't talk about, we had the observation of TTH production in June 2018. And it was through the combination of BB, multi-lepton, with the gamma gamma and ZZ decay channels. Um, the significance um, that we got as an observed significance of 6.3 sigma for Atlas and 5.3 um, sigma for CMS, in both cases higher than the predictions. And they were key roles by people um, from throughout the Berkeley team. So actually a picture we took at the time, which was published in a news article to do it. And again, here you can see the different channels and indeed the combined um, values that we had. Of course, that was a few years ago, so we've moved on. And there's some very interesting things you can do with TTH production. You can ask, what are the CP properties of the Higgs boson interactions with top quarks? And in order to do that, you can measure these parameters um, here, and you can check whether your measurement is actually consistent with the standard model. You can also ask an interesting question about what is the sign of the coupling of the Higgs to fermion? And a good way to probe this is by looking for Higgs production with a single top quark, which I haven't said much about. And this is just a selection out of many others. Finally, in the last few minutes, I want to talk about the Higgs to charm. Here's a plot which actually shows you our measurements of the Higgs couplings as a function of the particle masses. And as I mentioned, there's this complex structure in these couplings. So far, we've measured the coupling of Higgs to bottom and the Higgs to top, but we don't know anything about um, quarks in other generations. Remember those first, second, and third generation in our table. Higgs to charm, that was thought to be impossible, it was never discussed in the TDR. In fact, it was thought to be impossible until we started working on it. It's good reason for that. The cross section for charm production of the LHC is higher than bottom. The branching ratio for Higgs to charm is 20 times smaller than Higgs to be bottom. And that actually means in your analysis that the Higgs decay to bottom quarks will be a significant background. Tagging charm jets is more difficult than tagging bottom jets. And on top of it, the theoretical uncertainties related to charm production are larger than bottom. So all in all, it becomes much harder and you can compare the two plots um, from a recent data set between Higgs to BB and Higgs to Char. Initial attempts um, focused on using things like exclusive charm decays, where you end up with a J I particle and a photon. What I introduced was using a strategy following Higgs to BB, 
where you can have three channels, zero lepton, one lepton, and two. Slightly different strategies for Atlas and CMS. In Atlas, we use a cut base, and we're trying to fit that invariant mass. CMS is using a multivariate technique, and they also include some of those boosted jets. And here's an event display showing a recent Higgs to Chart event. Now, the challenge in tagging charm jets is that its properties lie between those of jets from the two backgrounds, from bottom and light. So a number of different features, things like lifetime, number of particles produced in the decay, also the mass. To illustrate this, I have these three 2D plots at the bottom where you can see the discrimination between bottom and charm or charm and light, same one in all the plots, but it's showing you for B jets, charm jets, and light. What you wanna see is that for B jets, you have this population at the top, so you can easily get B jets by themselves. For light jets, you have this population at the bottom left, but charm is really sort of populating in between. And so in order to really find how to select these charm jets at all, you kind of have to compromise. Do you need to get rid of light? Do you need to get some bottom? How many charm jets can you get? And it's really quite challenging. The first limits we got from Atlas used only the two lepton channel. We reached something like 100 times the standard model. There was a subsequent limit from CMS using all three channels. They got to 70 times the standard model. And just recently, there was a limit from Atlas using all three channels and our full data set from run two, and they reached 26 times the standard model, which also can be translated into sort of a scaling on the charm coupling relative to the standard model prediction, something like 8.5 um, needs to be less than that. And here, I think the challenge is, are we going to be able to reach evidence or observation with the high luminosity LHC data set? That brings me to the end. I think that the first and second runs of the LHC have been fascinating, exciting. We were privileged to discover a new elementary particle. However, the challenges, channels used for the discovery were anticipated. They were indeed the benchmark channels for the detector design. And this talk is focused on some results that were not anticipated, which allowed us to learn about the interaction of the Higgs with the quarks, in particular, the bottom, the top, and the charm. And some indeed were thought to be impossible. And so my small message for the future, and many in the audience here, you are the future, is to always learn from the past, but not to let the past constrain you. And clever ideas and innovation can make the impossible possible. And I'm personally looking forward to run three, high luminosity, LHC and beyond. And you'll have to forgive me. Given the content of this talk, I'm not gonna talk about any projections. Thank you. Thank you very much, Heather. So now is the time for questions, please either, uh raise your hand in the raise hand window, add it to the chat, or, uh, or add it to the q and I have all three windows open here. So I don't know if I'm having technical issues because I don't see any raised hands. I don't see any either at the moment, Marjorie. Um, I see one. Oh, I see a few. Ah, two. Here we are. They're starting to come in. Okay. So let me start with Chris McKee. Okay. I'm, I'm adding you to the allow to talk. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. That was a very uh, clear talk, Heather. My question is uh, what are the prospects for being able to set? Uh, limits on the uh, existence and masses of possible supersymmetric uh, particles uh, based on the uh, types of experiments you're doing. Gosh, um, so that would be that would be an entire talk to itself um, to do it. Indeed, what we've done so far is for many different supersymmetric particles, we've set limits. Um, for example, for like large like quarks and gluinos up to something like the TV scale um, and beyond. Um, for heavier particles, things like the top spork, the limits are indeed lower. And supersymmetric particles that get produced through electroweak, there we have even some of our weaker limits um, to do it. And so that's what we have kind of right now. As we go to the high luminosity LHC, the energy is only going to increase a little bit. It's probably going to go from 13 to 14 TV. So that doesn't really give a, a huge reach in mass. Um, beyond what we have. It gives us a bit, but but not so much. But what it really helps us is because we get so many more events, we can start looking for some of those rarer processes. So things like the electroweak um, supersymmetric production, that will be something quite um, interesting to follow up as we get to the high luminosity LHC. 
Good, thank you. Young Ki, I think you're next. <clears throat> yeah, uh, thanks for a nice talk, Heather. So I have a question about the motivation about the, the Higgs to charm coupling. So I understand that Higgs to top quark coupling is important in terms of the, 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 the mass of the Higgs particle, but I wonder what is the physical motivation for the Higgs to charm quark? Yeah, so the motivation, right? At least I think there's different reasons for different people. But for myself, I am deeply bothered by the fact that we have this complex structure in the coupling of the Higgs boson to the different um, fermions. And in particular in this quarks sector, right? If you look at this plot here, you can see that the range of these couplings is really quite large. And at the moment, the way that we account for this in the Lagrangian is we just add in terms for their masses and that gives us the coupling. Yet we have no reason for why these are so different. Secondly, sort of related to that, right? We have all these different generations in both the quark and the, and the electron sectors, but we don't have a strong reason for why this is the case. And so that's why I think it's important to look outside the third generation, look at the other generations. Ideally, I'd like to look at them all as perhaps this is going to be a way that can shed light on one of these puzzles that we just don't know the answer to. Okay, I see. That thanks a lot. So do we have any other questions? I think I spot something in the chat maybe, Marjorie, or is it not a question? Ah, here, yes, there is something in the chat. Um, so uh, so let, me, uh, let me read it out. How do you perceive the issue of dark matter in the context of the standard model? So I think dark matter is one of our big reasons why we know that the, that the standard model cannot be complete. Um, because we know from various different cosmological and astrophysical observations that there is dark matter out there. Yet in the standard model, you notice I didn't show you a dark matter particle um, to describe it. We have a number of different ideas about how dark matter might be accommodated in the standard model. For example, you know, we talked about supersymmetry a bit ago. This could be one possible candidate. It's true, it's become less compelling. But I personally, if we think that dark matter is a particle, I think it's absolutely critical to figure out what type of particle that is and how it can be incorporated together with all our other particles. And I view that as one of the very important questions that we have um, in particle physics and beyond today. Okay. So there's, thanks. So any other questions? Okay, so if not, then uh, thanks everyone for attending and thank you, Heather, for a, a very clear overview of what we still have to learn about the Higgs. And we'll see everybody in the colloquium next week. <laughs>